Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's ExoLife Hangout. It is November 1st, the very first day of a glorious month where we're going to be having a lot of great hangouts, two of which will be an ExoLife Hangout, and the first of which will be today. Today, we're going to be talking about, well, a lot of things, but we're going to be talking about what transhumanism, and I'm going to bring up the singularity, and we're going to talk about what that means. And we're going to talk about the ethics of emerging technologies. Just because we can do something, does that mean we should? And because this is an Exo Life Hangout, and we're talking about life in the universe, we're going to also put a spin on this about what can we do? What sort of technologies can we enable to hopefully help us travel to the stars? Will it help us travel to the stars? And... Um, stuff like that so that's our hangout today uh let me bring up my oh and but before i i want to say a couple of little housekeeping things uh i am being really good now at filling out the hangouts calendar so if you go to deepastronomy.space slash hangouts you will see all of the hangouts that i have confirmed and set up either with kevin here or harley or carol or whomever we're doing for the hangout so if you want to know what's coming up next please check out that hangout calendar and you will get a good uh, uh idea of what's coming up next uh so i hope you do that and we i am looking at, at a variety of uh of live chats but today i am doing something sort of different i have this little gizmo here that i'm using on wirecast uh so if you use the exolife hashtag on twitter i will see it on my little command console here and i might make it come up on this little thing here if you uh, are saying something that is interesting or you're tweeting at us using the exo life hangout as you see in that little tweet right there so we hope you'll use it but nevertheless i'm still looking at all the other things i'm looking at the live chat on youtube and all the all the regulars are there so adam adam synergy's back galaxia alexander reinders all of these guys uh Al andrew planet Tons of great people out here watching today. So I'm looking at the live chat there. I'm also on Periscope. We're on Facebook, folks, and I'm actually monitoring this stuff. So here's hoping that my stream this today goes well. My ISP last time, as many of you know, took a nosedive. But I think I've mitigated a lot of that. I have three different ways in which to mitigate this. So anyway, there's that. So without any more ado, let me bring up my... Um, what I call the my my scientific Brady Bunch here. Hello, he, here's here we all are. And joining me uh, as she always does, my co-host, Dr. Svetlana Berdugina. She is from the Planets Foundation. In the upper left is Kevin Lewis, also from the Planets Foundation. So, Hello, welcome, guys. It's good to be back with you again. Thank you, Tony. Good. Let's Thanks. talk a little bit about the Planets Foundation. Just a little bit. You guys just finished a Kickstarter campaign. And now we're look. What what do you guys? Let's just give a real brief summary. Let's not go into it too much because a lot of people who've come back know. But I just want to give you guys a little chance to talk a little bit about what the Planets Foundation is doing. Go ahead, Svetlana. Okay, so we are Planets Foundation, an international nonprofit organization to search for life in the universe, and uh, we have our own approaches to do that. We build uh, high contrast uh, sensitive telescopes, which are capable of detecting first exoplanets, then their uh, atmospheres, and um, uh, also most recently surfaces. We can map surfaces of these planets with these telescopes. The paper which we've written actually will appear tomorrow on Archive. It's a good news. So anybody is interested to see how uh, planet surfaces can be mapped can look it up. And so the Planet Foundation uh, builds the tel uh, telescope right now as a uh, called Planets, uh, so on Haleakala Obser Observatory in Maui. And we're planning to build um, ELF telescope, which is ExoLife Finder. And two Kickstarter campaigns we had this year were dedicated to get a little bit support for, for these two projects. And we are very thankful to all our backers who, who helped us and all Tony also very much help, uh, thankful to your advertisement on your channel. Hey, and the great I, collaboration we have here. I know it's it, it's. It, I love working with you guys, so it's really great. So that was uh, that, so. Thank you, Svetlana. I appreciate it. My guest today uh, is uh, from his name. His name is Doctor James Hughes, but he likes to be called J. That's the letter J, not the J A Y. Right, 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 J. 
That's right. And good. He is the executive director of the Institute for the Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And I understand you also work with uh, Nick Bostrom and others, right? Is that on, at your uh, at your institute? Nick was the co-founder of the IET. He now has his own uh, think tank at uh, Oxford University, the Future of Humanity Institute. Okay, great. Well, welcome to our Hangout. Now, I don't know what you know about what we do here, but this is a deep astronomy channel. We uh, we discuss all kinds of possibilities of life in the universe and things like that. And today, uh, Kevin has is, is brought you in to help us understand a couple of things. When it comes to space travel in particular, interstellar travel specifically, um, it is a problem to get anywhere in a reasonable amount of time with biological bodies. And so the first I ever heard about this topic was when I read Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. But the uh, when I read that book, this was like in 2006 or something like that, uh, it was, I thought it was really, really optimistic. So, um, nevertheless, here we are about 10 years later. We still, I think, are waiting for the singularity to get here. But, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, what, what it is you're working on. The, give us a, a sort of an overall summary of the things that interest you. And, uh, in particular with this idea of transhumanism, because I don't know what it is. So I'm hoping you can help me understand it. Okay, well, let's start with transhumanism. Um, <clears throat> I was the first executive director of the World Transhumanist Association, uh, which is now called Humanity Plus. And transhumanism is basically the idea that uh, human beings have the opportunity and the right to use technologies to... Oh, I'm trying to get myself in the screen. Okay, there. Um, to use technologies to enhance themselves, to be... Um, uh, live longer, have healthier bodies, and um, to have more cognitive abilities, more ability to uh, control our emotions. Um, and those are very contested ideas. Uh, there's people that we call the bioconservatives who generally think that that's not a great idea. And Bioconservatives, uh, so you said? But Yeah, bioconservatives or, or techno-conservatives, Luddites, if you're being really um, <laughs> rude. And uh, I have um, uh, tried to engage with those folks over the years, and they come in a lot of different flavors. There are religious objections uh, to the transhumanist idea. There's um, uh, secular objections. There's objections about safety and efficacy. Um, and there are people who just think it's all uh, not going to happen. So uh, if you don't think it's going to happen, then there's not really much to worry about. Um, you know, you just think we're nuts. Um, but it, and we think that human beings have basically been co-evolving with technology for the last million years since we <clears throat> controlled fire. Fire was the first uh, technology which allowed us to consume enough calories and protein so that our prefrontal cortex could start to get bigger. And we've been co-evolving with technology ever since. So from that perspective, we're not for humans. We're not humans 1.0, we're something in between. And so the term transhuman is partly a reference to the notion that there may be some threshold that we pass in the future where we become post-humans and that we're currently in the transitional stage between human 1.0 and the post-human state, whatever that might be. And the other uh, idea is that um, we need a new kind of ideology that you know, basically transhumanism is an expression of uh, enlightenment values, the ideas of uh, faith in science and reason and technology and the capacity for human improvement um, and the right, rights of individuals to control our own bodies and brains. And so uh, insofar as humanism is an ideology and it's that's a very amorphous term, but uh, the idea has been that as we transition and become more than human, we also need to have a, a broadened and expanded idea of what humanism might mean. So that's where the term transhumanism comes from, and, and I still affiliate with that term. But it doesn't tell you very much about people. You can be um, religious or secular. You can be uh, you know, authoritarian or democratic. Um, most transhumanists tend to be uh, liberal uh, in both politics and in terms of individual rights. 
uh, but they come in a lot of different flavors. And so in recent years, we've begun to use the term techno progressive. Um, and that's so the IET, the Institute for Ethics Emerging Technologies, which emerged out of the World Transhumanist Association about 12 years ago. We call that a techno progressive uh, think tank because we are uh, explicitly on the left side of the political spectrum. And um, we're trying to carve out uh, a set of policy questions that we think need to be addressed and that most people in the policy academic world don't take seriously yet because they don't think that these technologies are possible or going to come soon, soon enough for it to be worth talking about uh, these days. So questions like technological unemployment as a result of automation um, or the catastrophic risks of emergent super intelligent computing, um, genetic engineering, which now is quite possible because of CRISPR and some other developments. So we've been uh, working on a variety of programs over the last 12 years, engaging with people who work in popular culture, science fiction authors and uh, television script writers and so forth to try to encourage more realistic and complex narratives around the future. We've done work on catastrophic risks, um, on what we call the longevity dividend, the benefits to pub the public that we see in anti-aging medicine. So, um, but in recent, uh, in the last year and a half, we've been focusing a lot of our attention on developing uh, a techno-progressive policy handbook. Now, one of the things that we would do address in the techno-progressive policy handbook is um, Policies around space uh, were generally supportive of a cooperative, non-militarized, non-property-centered um, space exploration program. And um, I've given thought ever since I was a teenager to, um, you know, what are the arguments for the space program? I mean, Tang is a uh, pretty <laughs> minimal payoff, even if it was a spinoff of the space program, for... for um, space exploration. I think we do have a moral obligation to get off this uh, ball of dirt. Uh, and that moral obligation stems from the fact that we're so far, uh, we're the only uh, form of intelligence that we've met. And uh, so I think, you know, we, we would like to argue for a, a human space program on those grounds. Um, not everyone shares that enthusiasm. Um, but in terms of your question about the relationship between transhumanism and space program, just say that I think we, we generally agree in the transhumanist movement that, um, the, that sending bags of water and meat into space is probably uh, not a very effective way to uh, do a space program. And so we will probably eventually be exploring space in uh, various kinds of cyborg forms and then perhaps even miniaturized nanobot forms that will be a lot easier to uh, to get into the stars and uh, you know von Neumann machines and all those kinds of things but we can we can talk more about that yeah yeah I do I want to but let me let me before I go down the future road a little bit surely you guys have thought a little bit about the past too and can do you use that as a guide for example the last hundred years have seen quite a bit of technological innovation that has changed our daily lives for uh, people can argue for the better or worse i mean certainly if you if you talk to um you know certain people they that the, the technological lifestyle that we live now isn't better than what we had before but um what what sort of milestones in the past have do you find to be sort of the sort of tra have there been any that have been kind of transhumanist if that makes any sense i mean i know based on what you're calling transhumanism does the past offer any guide to the future of what is what's happened well, I think it does a lot, um, and I think it's important for people not to get um, fixated on the next technological development as some kind of threshold, because most of the questions that are posed by emerging technologies are posed by previous technologies as well. Um, if you think about the issue of uh, humans downloading parts of their consciousness onto what we call the exocortex, or the, you know, your cell phone and your laptop and Google are all part of your thinking process now of our uh, of our knowledge. It's ways of storing our memory, and we feel like we've had a stroke when we lose one of those devices. Um, 
we started that process with literacy. That was when we started to be able to download the contents of our minds onto external storage media and upload them again later through our eyes, right? So uh, the, the process of becoming literate and, de and depending increasingly on these kind of external storage media started a long time ago. It's going to get more interesting when we have computers directly wired up to our neurons, but the questions are still fundamentally the same. Do you have a right to think whatever you want and, and record whatever you want? Do other people get to tell you what you can have in your, you know, in your storage media? Um, all of these kinds of questions are posed, but they're old questions. So um, I don't think that uh, most of the transhumanist questions are, are that novel. The kinds of things that are truly novel have to do with the degree to which we can control the brain, because most of those, those things were just thought experiments in the past about what if you were able to upload your consciousness and then uh, uh, copy it multiple times, who would be married to your wife, who would get your property, um, and so forth. Those kinds of things people have been thinking about for a long time, and there's various kinds of myths and stories about it, but uh, we expect that in the future that will actually happen, and we'll have to figure it out. Okay. Um so I'm going to go ahead and ask Eurek's question uh, f uh, from the live chat on YouTube. He's asking, first ethical question from me. Some of these technologies may only apply to newborns, for example, gene editing. Would that not create a segregation of the population of have and have not? So is well, it, we, yeah, that's a good question, actually. What, what effect would that have? Well, we live in a world with haves and have nots. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we think a techno progressive approach is important because... Um, some of the folks in the futurist or emerging technologies area have a kind of uh, Pollyanna-ish view of this. They think that either inequality is not a problem, and if some people enjoy the rapture of the nerds and take off into super intelligence and the rest are left behind, that's fine. Um, and some people in that domain think if there is a problem, it'll all be fixed by magic technology. Everyone's going to have magic nano boxes that'll make everything that they want, everything's gonna be free, no one will starve, and so who cares? We think it, it is a problem that um, right now, some people <clears throat> die because they don't have access to bed nets and others um, are spending millions of dollars on chemotherapy. The problem is not one that we currently address by denying anybody chemotherapy uh, and sending their chemotherapy money to the bed nets. There are lots of other ways to work on medical equity around the world. Um, you know, antidepressant drugs in the North, we don't say, oh, you shouldn't have antidepressant drugs until everybody in the South has access to X, you know, has access to clean water. Um, so what we think is gonna happen is that we're gonna develop increasingly robust technologies that uh, allow people to live longer, healthier lives. And those are gonna be incorporated into our healthcare systems in various ways either as, um, uh, as medicine that you can buy in the private sector or in a public uh, provision. So most of the industrialized world has public health insurance. So the question will be there, what do you cover and what do you don't? Um, what do you give everyone the anti-aging shot or not? Um, and here, hopefully we'll have universal health insurance someday, but uh, we don't yet. And so we, we have a more complicated issue here in the United States. Um, now, about kids, it does get one level more complicated because we generally allow parents to make all kinds of medical decisions for their kids. Kids can't consent to anything. Uh, they can't consent to being created in the first place. Um, and we, since the experience of the 1930s where we, you know, in the United States and other places, we were involuntarily sterilizing people because we thought they didn't have good genes, um, because of that eugenic experience, we have set a very high bar for reproductive freedom and liberty and parental choice. Uh, you can have kids and no one is allowed to tell you no, even if you know that you have terrible genes, uh, that you're going to be passing on genes for depression and flat, flat footedness and obesity and all kinds of things. That's your right as a parent. Um, I think what our general assumption is that most parents have the interests of their kids in mind. And when you tell them, look, if you take fish oil during pregnancy or you take uh, you know, vitamin B during pregnancy, it's gonna help your kid. It's gonna reduce their, the risk of having spina bifida. 
that um, they will do that, and they generally do. And it's the role of the state to encourage parents, maybe not oblige them or require them to, but uh, to encourage them as much as we can through prenatal counseling to make those kinds of decisions. So um, what we're going to face in the future is that we are going to have gene therapies that will be able to do similar uh, beneficial things for kids. And they may, uh, some of them will be clearly benefits and some of them will just be lateral choices. So a benefit would be uh, reducing your kid's risk of developing premature cancer or Alzheimer's or something like that, or, or perhaps extending their uh, intelligence or their uh, height or something like that. Height, height's more iffy, but, um, but we'll also have choices like should parents be allowed to choose their kid's hair color or eye color or, you know, uh, musculature if they, if parents especially value uh, sports, uh, should they be able to choose certain kinds of muscular? Yeah, things? sort of designer babies, right? We've heard about right. that before. Yeah. Um, and, and most people have really icky feelings about that. I, I would vigorously defend parents' right to make those decisions. Okay, well, I want to go back a little bit to this idea of the haves and have-nots for a second. We always hear sure. about uh, the rich people in the world, and we're getting a little bit off topic, but I'm, I'm going to bring it back to space flight in a minute, uh, where they are already investing in technologies that benefit themselves in some way. For example, to mitigate their the effects of global warming ruining the planet, they're building these own little personal bunkers for themselves to stay in, and there's gonna they're they're already planning a lot of there's a lot of plans for technologies. Um, that they're developing to help with their long, their own personal longevity. I think Peter Thiel from PayPal was doing some bizarre stuff with uh, technology preserving different things. Um, what's going to stop that? It seems to me like the technologies that would come along that would benefit everyone probably won't in practice. I mean, you, they will exist yeah, I, first and foremost for the rich people. And I then, had exactly the same uh, question, basically. It seems like technology is supposed to bring equality, but it brings more inequality and also in educational uh, aspect. Right. So Medical, while it would be great oh, to have this technology that would benefit everybody, increase everyone's lifespan, which that alone gives me a lot of pause because we're already putting a lot of pressure on this planet with so many people. Uh, you know, I just don't see how this, this is going to, we're going to, it's not going to trickle down. <laughs> I don't see, I don't see this, this tech, the rich people, rich and the, the people with the money, the corporations with the money will be the ones developing this technology. And there's nothing to stop them from being selective about who uses it. I mean, that's more of a policy well, political <clears throat> thing, but. I'm, I'm a sociologist and the question of the relationship between technological innovation and equality is an old one. Um, you could think that, you know, back when we were hunter-gatherers, we were relatively equal, although there were still chieftains and, you know, warlocks who had more corn than everybody else. But um, once we had the transition to agricultural society and began to develop a surplus, then some people claimed ownership over that surplus and became kings and lords and knights and whatnot. And then we had the innovation of industrial society and we developed into workers and owners of capital. Uh, and now we're heading into some kind of post-industrialism and perhaps post-work society altogether. <clears throat> so there are different theories about you know, how that might play out in terms of equality. I don't think that there's any uh, necessary path. I think it, it, it's possible to imagine a future with uh, more inequality than we have today, and and that's why we should steer away from that future and towards one that has more equality. But I think that the thing that we can derive from the historical lesson is that technological innovation changes the terrain on which people struggle for equality. It, it gives the people who uh, don't have the resources access to new tools, new communications technologies, new, new ways to fight, new ways to wage war, uh, that tend to um, allow them to fight for more equality. It also gives the powerful and the rich access to technologies for oppression and control. <clears throat> so I think all of those things are possible in the future. It's possible to imagine both uh, scenarios. That's why we think it's important to stake out. This is the, the path to an egalitarian and yet technologically sophisticated future. We, I, at the IET, the techno-progressive point of view, is that there's no necessary relationship between technology and inequality. If you think that every technology that gets developed is going to be used by the rich and powerful to screw the poor, 
then you should be opposed to everything. <laughs> we should be going back to the caves in order to have to achieve equality. And I don't think very many people seriously believe that. No, I but that's um, the role of society, I guess, to regulate it in the government, and that's what right. uh, where your democratic attitude comes, uh, I guess, and an ethical attitude comes into play. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, let me bring this back into uh, uh, you, these te- these ethics and technologies for exploring the solar system and then maybe even the stars. Um, first of all, I'd like to know, what do you think? What what technologies are you looking at that might best be available for us to use to help our efforts in going into traveling to Mars, for example, which has a very hostile environment? Um, are, there, are there things that might make us more, I'm just thinking out loud, uh, more um, uh, resistant to radiation, for example, or um, are there, you know, and then beyond going beyond the solar system, even, you know, the, the long distances traveling to the stars, what technologies you see coming up that you think might help us with that? Well, um, you know, one of the people in our sphere of futurists and transhumanists who thinks a lot about the technological trajectory is Ray Kurzweil, you mentioned him earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a pretty lockstep, deterministic view of the way the technology is going to play out. Yes, he does. Um, (laughs) And I don't think we're all on board necessarily with, you know, his, you know, by 2030, we're going to be able to do X kind of projections. But in terms of things getting smaller, faster, and more powerful, Uh, That seems to be... And his thing is this exponential growth also. Everything is growing at an exponential rate. Right. The things get smaller, faster, more powerful at an exponential rate. I think most of us agree that that's happening. It's it's pretty obvious that it's happening. And if that happens by doing more bio stuff or more nano stuff, or uh, if there's more artificial intelligence progress than we expected or, or less... Um, we, we're going to end up eventually pretty much in the same kinds of places. So one of the things that's going to happen is have more control over the body. And <clears throat> excuse me. Um, insofar as the obstacles to sending these bags of meat and water into space have to do with, for instance, exposure to radiation and um, getting cancer, we probably will have more robust immune systems in the future that will be backed up by various kinds of nanorobotics. And that will be able to detect uh, cancers at a very early stage and zap them you know, in the micro nano stage. Um, we'll be able to uh, have various kinds of changes in our skin. So we might, some people have imagined, and in fact, one of the earliest uh, um, kind of transhumanist texts for the 1920s was an imagination about what uh, an astronaut might need as a cyborg body in order to uh, explore space without a spacesuit. I mean, <laughs> it was kind of an odd text because we, we developed spacesuits and they did a pretty good job, but um, there's been a lot of thinking in science fiction and, uh, and some in exobiology. <clears throat> and in fact, the term cyborg comes to us from a NASA uh, document that was written in 1962 trying to imagine the feedback loops between technology and the astronaut's body and brain that might be necessary to maintain the homeostasis and stability of an astronaut in space. So, you know, I think that there are some changes um, that we could imagine people voluntarily undergoing that would allow them to be more robust in space. But as I said, you know, if you if we try to imagine the exploration of the stars, the amount of propulsion that's needed to send us into the stars versus a condensed version of us that's backed up and recorded uh, in some kind of, you know, computer media is makes me think that we probably will be doing it that way first, rather than, uh, you know, sending at least artificial intelligent probes and or perhaps copies of human consciousness into space. Really, in though, because are, I just want to interject yeah. that we have we have genetic editing capability now you mentioned CRISPR uh yeah. earlier and i'm, I'm gonna re- i'm gonna read dj override's question and then i'm gonna expand it a bit could we physically gene edit diseases from future children in order to make cancer and other diseases a thing of the past for future generations or is that too far-fetched and then i want to add to that what about editing genes that would make for a better astronaut someone who would be ideally suited for harsh long-term space environments 
<clears throat> right. Well, cancer resistance is certainly one of the targets of potential gene therapy. Um, but cancers come in a lot of different flavors. I mean, there's the P53 gene, which is in about 50% of genes. And it's easy to imagine that we might be able to come up with therapies and then perhaps um, engineered vaccine resistance to uh, the emergence of any of those kind of cancers. But then there's the other 50% of cancers, which come in a lot of different flavors. So, you know, completely defeating cancer with the gene therapy is as probably as difficult as uh, addressing all the genes that cause intelligence. We've identified about 1,500 genes that seem to be tied to intelligence. So a lot of these traits are multifactorial. Um, so the, the proposal I had, which I think we will be doing that, we will be making people more resilient and <clears throat> disease-free uh, with gene therapy and gene editing. And some of that will have to occur at the uh, prenatal or preconceptive stage. We could uh, edit the sperm, edit the eggs, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but then adding to the body these kind of nano backup systems that will allow, you know, you get your basically your body would download in real time information from the CDC. You know, this new pathogen's just been detected, uh, just like your computer is constantly downloading updates of uh, antivirus. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, I can't imagine that kind of life. It's already right, annoying right. enough to have to deal with the. Software right. updates. You just, yes, scan <laughs> up for a moment until we upload your program. Right. <laughs> and that will be one of the kinds of inequality. You know, some people will have the license to have really robust uh, nanoimmune systems and to download on a regular basis, and others will not be able to afford that and, and so forth. So, you know, I think that th that kind of engineering approach is probably for cancer um, and for pathogens. It's probably more likely than trying to make a body that is completely immune to all cancers and pathogens. Okay. Well, I wonder, something just happened on the chat. What was that? That Indian dude. I'm not sure what just happened, but thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. I want to read Charlotte Gribben's comment uh, because she has special dispensation. She's actually, I know her. History is not that relevant in this discussion because... I'm sorry, but I thought it was. Uh, because the problem is not between the haves and have-nots. It's bigger than that. Genetics are basically going to create a whole new species of human. And that is an excellent point. So we're talking about these sort of gene splicing, uh, disease curing, life lo longevity-inducing treatments to genes. When do, when do we stop being human? At, at some point, you got to ask yourself, well, wait a minute, we've, we've edited the crap out of this thing. Are we still a human being or not? Yeah, and the question, should we worry about that? Should we worry and should we about, worry about that? Human? That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, okay. So to, first to start with whether we turn into two different kinds of species. If you go back to like the time machine by H.G. Wells, he was worried about that, saw that as a dystopian future. I think most of us would. Um, I think one of the questions is a technological one, which is that if we suddenly discover that there's some <clears throat> tweak <clears throat> excuse me, which turns people into X-Men. And half of us uh, take that gamble and half of us don't. Yes, then half of us will be a different species. But it's far more likely with CRISPR and some of these other technologies and with the cybernetic enhancements that they will come in a whole variety of options, right? We don't have, we, we do have Apple people and, and Microsoft people, but we haven't gone to war. And there's all kinds of computer options, and somebody might have a, a, an iPhone, but also use a Microsoft computer at work, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you if we imagine that, uh, you know, one third of the population does the intelligence tweak, and a, and a different third does the bio tweaks, the question is, would it ever become so that there was one group who was super enhanced and, and the rest who were not? And the, the principal thing that we have to worry about there is wealth, that wealth may determine access to certain kinds of enhancements, which may then have a, a, a feedback circular effect that you, the more of that kind of an uh, intelligence or ability that you have, the more wealth you get, and then the more kinds of enhancements you get, and then it just takes off and we become an unequal world. So a more unequal world. Um, so I think we have to pay close attention to the wealth question. And then just, you know, if there are technologies which come along, which uh, threaten to divide society abruptly, that would be a huge problem. Now, a second order of the problem is if we start to change and, and develop these enhancements, do we become an increasingly diverse 
society with our children having more abilities than the parents. The term generation gap from you know, Margaret Mead was basically a description of the 20th century, which said that for almost all of human history, you could learn all the important stuff from your parents. They, they knew they had figured out how to make the flint knives. They had figured out how to plow the fields. They had figured out how to work in the factories and they could teach you those skills. But in the 20th century, we began to change so rapidly that uh, the kids began to learn stuff that their parents never uh, caught up with, and that created a generation gap. Um, it's quite possible to imagine abrupt generation gaps in the future if we make accessible uh, gene tweaks for babies that make the babies twice as intelligent as their parents, and then we don't, uh, you know, they, they, have, they start teaching us when they're three, and we can't teach them anything anymore. But that's... I think that's an unlikely future. I think that there will be a continuous change. And it may be that just as our ancestors probably would not be thrilled to find out what had become of their descendants in us because we violate all their values and <clears throat> we allow men to lie with men and we do all kinds of crazy things in our society. <clears throat> it may be that in the future, uh, our descendants would be people that we wouldn't necessarily relate to today, but the change would have been more or less a continuous one. We would, we would, you know, we don't want to disown our kids. Our kids won't want to disown their kids. Even if we feel terrible about our great grandkids, it's not our problem. It's our, our grandkids' problem. Well, that. Oh, go ahead, Svetlana. I have a question. Yes, in this relation, like we, like you emphasize, it all goes to wealth in the end. Yeah. And the, as you, uh, uh, as a scientist in sociology, I wanted to ask, like we see that all social animals including humans they have kind of hierarchy and the question is that is it like uh, really necessary for intelligence to have that hierarchy do we expect from other civilizations having the same hierarchy system will this inequality be always there in our society are, whatever are you, we do are you saying is it a is it a quality of being human that we establish these hierarchies is that or is that what you're yeah asking? it's okay. not only humans we see it in animals as well but like but right. we are genetically connected i mean like it's a life on earth um is it like you what do you think is it just like is really characteristics of life in general or only like what we have here well i think there are two kinds of hierarchy that are kind of baked into our neurobiology the first is patriarchy, the uh, gender division, which there's all kinds of theories about where it comes from. But, you know, I, I tend to think that it's probably uh, the result of the fact that men can generally beat up women and um, the degree to which we have created societies in which we're not allowed to do that anymore <clears throat> is the degree to which we've been over, able to overcome patriarchy. <clears throat> the, um, the second thing that's baked into our genes is male dominance hierarchies. And we see this in simians and uh, you know, all of our ape cousins, um, that as soon as uh, any group of male apes are, and female apes to some extent as well, are introduced into a group, they immediately uh, become anxious, their uh, stress levels goes up, go up, their cortisol levels, until they figure out where they are in the pecking order, you know, where, who the alpha male is, who they have to be subordinate to, and so forth. So at that micro level, I think there is a strong tendency towards hierarchy. The, I don't think that that extrapolates necessarily the social hierarchy to uh, class structures and uh, na you know, white nationalism. And I, I don't think that those are necessarily baked into the genes. But there, there is, uh, I think, important uh, thinking that needs to be done about what it would mean once we identify those neurobiological or genetic roots of aspects of our simian or monkey brain <clears throat> that we no longer feel are necessary. Yeah, maybe we just genetically yeah. overcome, mo yeah. modify the humans to overcome this inequality uh, right. and hierarchy. Well, I can That's see there's not a reason to. I can see what you're getting at, Svetlana. There's probably no reason to think that a another civilization out there would follow the same hierarchy or even have one at all. Maybe I mean, it's a, no maybe, maybe it's a law of survival for the yeah, society. Right. We don't know. And if evolution is anything, it's a it's more of a historical story of what yeah. happened here uh, on this planet, and we can follow that out and 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 go to what Jay's been talking about. Let me ask a um. Let me ask a question from the so Indian. Just let me add one more thing. On yeah, that yeah. End. I think. Another aspect of that is in-group, out-group. We, we have a lot of in-group, out-group uh, neurobiology that's programmed into our amygdala. And so when we try to boost um, uh, empathy in people with uh, drugs like oxytocin, 
it mm -hmm. turns out that it makes them more racist because oh. um, what it's really acting on is that kind of monkey brain empathy for people who are like you when you look around, okay. you know, your family members and then your race. Wow. Um, and so we don't want that. And we and it also has to do with the amygdala. The amygdala is kind of the fear center of the brain. It turns out that conservatives and racists have much twitchier amygdalas. So, you know, they see a woman in a hijab or two men kissing or whatever. Their amygdala freaks out. And for liberals, uh, either their amygdala doesn't freak out because they're not as switchy or they have stronger prefrontal cortices that can tell their amygdalas to shut up because that's not an important thing to worry about. Um, and I think that those are things that we have uh, uh, already of the ability to control through mindfulness, uh, anti-biasing practices, but also drugs like propranolol, which is uh, uh, a drug for hypertension, turns out to make people less um, racist because it, it suppresses some of the fear responses that are at the root of those, uh, those biologically determined in-group, out-group responses. At any rate, I think there's a lot to be done in that area of improving human moral cognition. Yeah. And as we imagine what an improved life in space might be like, we yes, we could become a much more egalitarian species. Oh, that's very interesting. It's well, interesting, yeah, that it's all, I mean, we know that. It's all nonlinear. We we heal one side and we damage the other side, or vice versa. So that is... Well, I'm going to ask this question from that Indian dude because he's been supporting the channel, and I want, and it's and it's relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, sorry if you've already answered this, but how soon, as someone who watches technology and thinks about what's coming, do you think CRISPR, which is the gene editing, I guess it's a it's a it's a it's a tool, uh, mm -hmm. will be translated into clinical practice? How how soon do you think that might happen? I mean, they're using it now for things like cystic fibrosis, <laughs> I think. Uh, but how long do you think it might be before it gets into common use? Or should and and should it be put into common use? But both in terms of should and uh, is it, yes. It's already being applied to clinical practice. There was, um, I believe it was a cancer, a rare cancer that was recently treated with a CRISPR therapy. Uh, but yes, it's a, there are already... Um, therapies in the works that are using CRISPR-based models, and it's being used widely in experimental medicine that will have translational applications. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the restrictions that we should put on CRISPR, that's a part of a broader set of questions. What should, as we already said, what should parents be able to do with their kids? Uh, what should people be able to do with their own bodies? I think, you know, if you're allowed to, um, you know, it's hard to get a doctor if you agree to it, but if you're allowed to cut off your own leg, then why shouldn't we allow people to experiment on their own genes? You know, maybe doctors. Well, I'll tell you why. I, I, first of all, I, I, I'll tell you what worries me about this whole thing is unintended consequences, right? I mean, we okay. don't know where this will lead, right? Ch cutting off your leg is one thing. You're doing that to you, and it's a pretty definite thing, and it's drastic to be sure, but you're not affecting your progeny or anything else, right? So it's... How do you how do you gauge this? I mean, I, I use as an example the Asian carp fish in the in the Illinois River. There was a pest of snail or something in there that they wanted to get rid of by introducing the Asian carp that would eat it. But then the Asian carp ate everything and it ate the entire river. And now yeah. there's nothing but Asian carp. They tried to do a good thing, but it ended up being a real problem environmentally. As, as an example of unintended consequences. There are many stories like this, yeah? <laughs> right. So, yeah. we are we capable of seeing the long-term effect of what we're doing to ourselves here? I think um, your carp example is interesting because basically the regulatory challenges of genetic modification are directly proportional to the size of the creature. Um, if we have... Uh, a bio lab in everybody's garage in the future, uh, then everybody may have access to the ability to build a super bug, a super pathogen for accident that could accidentally wipe people out or could it, it be used as a terrorist weapon, a warfare weapon, and so forth. That's a serious challenge that we need to figure out how to address. Um, but the bigger the creature, the, e the, the easier it is to address. And right, humans are humans are fragile creatures and we could shoot them <laughs> or put them in prison. I, you know, so I, I don't, I've never met a, a, a proximate genetic therapy that I thought posed a real catastrophic risk to society uh, in humans, right? 
I, if we, most of the things that people are going to want to do for themselves is make themselves more intelligent, improve their memory, improve their health, improve their longevity. Maybe they'll want to make their skin green for cosmetic purposes or make, you know, have dark, different color hair. But none of these things are catastrophic risks to society in the same way that a super plague might be. So it's basically not a problem as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Well, um, okay. Well, I want to go back to, uh, we're talking about space travel and extra civilizations. Um, and we are also discussing the ethics of a lot of the technologies that might turn us into something called a transhuman or some, or get us beyond our biology, uh, in, in w using the, uh, effects of technology and so with with these ideas of of you know I, I asked you about um you know what do you could we use gene therapy to maybe help us better explore the solar system what technologies do you see coming down the pike that might help us uh explore or maybe even get to uh the stars or is there anything that you that your group might be thinking about along those terms well, as I said, to the degree that we've addressed space policy, it's mostly around the questions of how to regulate the exploration of space. But I think most of us would agree that um, human enhancement in general will make us more robust and resilient as a species as we begin to explore space. And the folks who are not in the IET, but in, in other uh, corners of futurism who are more libertarian, of course, look forward to the opportunities of escaping from the regulatory control of Earth authorities so that they can uh, engage in all kinds of radical experimentation in space. Um, and, you know, if you've read, uh, I'm sure you have read Blue Mars, Red Mars uh, series by, um, uh, who wrote that? It was Bear, uh, I think. It was a No, that's, uh, um, anyway, you know the yeah. series. Yeah, I know the series about. you're talking about, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, Stanley I, or Kim, Kim Stanley, Kim Stanley Robinson. Yeah. Right? yeah thank yeah. you. Uh, so, you know, the, he and, and, and most of the people who think, you know, uh, Heinlein's the moon is a harsh mistress. Most of the people who've thought about space exploration find it hard to imagine how we could maintain a multi-planetary or multi-solar system uh, governance structure that would really be effective. And so that basically you would have lots of autonomous uh, political and biological experiments going on around the solar system and, and the universe. Um, and so I think, you know, that is an, an opening for all kinds of, uh, of radical possibilities that maybe even if we lock things down here, they could be open there. Um, in terms of biological modification of a human being that really makes this possible to do more in space, besides becoming more resilient to solar radiation and, and some of the other risks that we might face, um, you know, uh, silicosis on Mars, I suppose, because there's lots of dust or things like that. Um, I really think that the speculation generally goes in a post-biological direction. And some of the exobiologists, like Milan Sirkovic, who um, have begun to think about the SETI project, for instance, you know, are we uh, looking for the wrong thing? Are we looking for the signals of biological species when, in fact, um, most intelligent species will just spend a brief period as intelligent meat sacks and will quickly transcend that into some kind of post biological form that would take an entirely different you know, manifestation of the universe. So um, I think that's probably the way we should be thinking too, that you know, uh, our, to the extent that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, an extension of human intelligence in the future, open question, um, then the von Neumann machines, self-replicating probes that we send out into the universe that begin to uh, engage in space colonization, uh, hopefully will have our consciousness encoded in them. And, and therefore, will be, it, it will be our project, even if we're not there as meat sacks. Man, that would be freaky. Could you imagine being a von Neumann probe of your own well, I think that self-replicates? Uh, Astronomical distances are so large that, indeed, within solar system, we can think biologically, but outside, beyond that, it should be non-biological, and we just have to accept that. that All right, well, does this, worry, does this worry any of you guys? 
Meat and bag, meat bags. Like meat saying. bag, water bags. Yeah. <laughs> Does this worry any of you guys? I mean, Elon Musk is terrified of of, no, of artificial intelligence. No, I think it's great. I mean, imagine we can travel with the speed of light if we are not meat bags anymore. This is great. You know, we can go so far. All right. So right. Svetlana's and looking forward it. to not being a meat bag, but I, I, I am. I mean, put me, me in the, in this uh, ele- electromagnetic wave. Send me out, <laughs> and I will be exploring the universe. I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah. You're okay with it too. Is- whether we can relate to those things that we create in the future. And that's this, it's, it's probably hard for us to even to imagine what the possibilities are, much less relate to them when we discover them. But, um, you know, by the time we get there, I think we'll have figured it out and, and we will be able to encode our values uh, in some way into those creatures. Yeah, and I like to bring all this to a story by... Um... Oh, just name popped out for me. A science fiction story when the humanity became electromagnetic waves traveling around, intelligent waves. You know, they, they see things, they, they observe, they learn, uh, but they cannot feel anymore. So we give up feelings, you know, that's fine. Well, yeah, it's those kinds of trade-offs that I think are interesting questions. I mean, we don't want to, um, you know, in the Odysseus, when, um, in the Odyssey, rather, when Odysseus meets the land of the lotus eaters, um, you know, they're basically all junkies lying around. Um, they seem to be fed, but they're, they're not happy. And the same question posed by H.G. Wells in Time Machine, you know, the Eloys and the Morlocks. Um, there are certain kinds of loss of ambition that may be, in fact, the answer to the Fermi paradox. You know, it may be that the reason we don't see all of our intelligent neighbors is that they get to a certain level of development and they all jack in their pleasure centers and watch uh, reality television the rest of their life. Wow, exactly. I had they not heard that. that. That's, a, that's an outstanding <laughs> idea. That's an interesting idea. Or, or I heard that uh, like they, they reach such a level of consciousness that they don't care about anything else in the universe. They just right. kind of out Transcension. there. You sort I mean, of yeah, atrophy. <laughs> That's a slightly more optimistic version that, you know, you could become enlightened at a certain level of consciousness and you become one with the universe or something like that. Yeah, you don't care about other species anymore. Yeah, I would imagine Ray Kurzweil didn't see that coming with the singularity. I mean, it would be this sort of atrophy of ambition. Oh, I think Ray actually does have a kind of um, transcendent uh, vision of what the future might be like. He uh, he does think that we have a moral obligation to turn the, intelli- the universe intelligent um, and that that intelligent universe might already in some sense be all around us. You know, that, that's the, the kind of the puzzle is that if you really play out the imagination about what uh, super intelligence and nanotechnology might be like in the future, we might be soaking in it and not knowing. You know, it might in fact be all around us. Right, okay. Well, the... Um, the uh... Oh, shoot, I just lost my thought. Um, oh, okay, we're talking about, uh, with, with going, with respect of, of leaving the planet, doing doing exploration, whether it be within our solar system or without, um, you said early in the Hangout that you felt like we should do this, that it is, you didn't, I don't think you said it was a moral imperative, but it is ethically something we should do, is that right? So in uh, philosophy, we have this question called metaethics, which is on, the, on what grounds can what anyone ever say someone should do something? Um, I don't have a solution to metaethics. I have a, you know, we all carry around our intuitions. I don't, I don't believe that there are shoulds written on the base of the universe. And even if there were, I don't know if that would be morally obligatory that I would have to follow the shoulds that our creator, you know, some people believe that we're living in a simulated universe. Yeah, I've heard that too. Um, but even if we are, yes. you know, even if we're living in the mind of God, I don't necessarily think you have an obligation to do anything on that basis, right? So, you know, that's the kind of existential crisis that we're in, is that once you give up on those moral absolutes, you have to basically make it up as you go along. For me, um, it seems self-evident that because we're the only creatures who create the idea of of good and bad and beautiful and not beautiful and these kinds of categories, that if we were to be extinguished in the universe, that those ideas and those values would also be extinguished. So if there is any meaningful thing in the universe, it's our intelligence and the intelligence that creates those categories, right? So for me, it just seems kind of self-referentially true that we um, that the should is that we should extend our consciousness into the universe and make sure it survives. Okay, uh, Kevin Omar Kuziaz is saying, "Please answer me. Can you find 
Oh wait, I yes. think I see. Oh, I see. Kenneth. Oh, okay. Well, well okay. Th- th- this, in terms of never mind. Yes, Tony, that's fine. I just wanted to say that the, you know, I don't want to get too political with this particular discussion. I right. want to try and keep it with science as much as I can. Omar. But I, I, I am interested in topics of ethics in the sense, like you say, we create ethics. We see examples in, of different <coughs> societies on Earth that create different kind of ethics. And um, like, as you bring this meta ethics, it might be not a universal concept at all, the ethics itself. It may be different for sure, but it may be even concept is not universal. Right. I mean, it may, we may uh, meet species who, if they have any parallel, it would be an aesthetic one. You know, it's that they, yes. think, they think that the universe exploration that they're doing is part of an art project and, and not an, es- an ethical project. Right. The, the notion that you have to respect other minds is basically part of our mammalian evolution, right? You know, you, even if you go to insects and other species, you know, they, they don't have any... Um, instinctive empathy for other members of their species or even their own children or their spouse, you know, their, their, their mating partners. So, we don't know. <laughs> well, you know, like, you know, insects that eat their, some degree, their, yes, their yes. mating partner at the end of the mating process and yeah. things like that. So, you know, a lot of our notions of what we expect to meet is so anthropocentrically narrow and blinkered. Right. The possibility space of intelligent minds is huge. And yeah. Um, and yeah, we just have to be prepared. That- this is absolutely true when we think like of searching class life and uh, intelligence in the universe that we project so much of our own principles there. And surely that's the only thing we know, but it's good to have this overall philosophical view that what is, can be universal and what cannot be universal. Well, it's right. hard, isn't it, Svetlana? I mean, and what else can we yes. do? We only know what... We know. We'll and... try. We'll try to jump out of this, our meat bags, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Star Trek, but you know the notion that we're yes, going to meet too. other other species that will be able to create a federation of planets and a liberal democratic, you, you know, right. utopia, <laughs> pretty unlikely. Um, but I think what Star Trek and that kind of imagination is more useful for is to try to imagine what a radically diverse post-human yes. experience might be like. That we might, in fact have, you know, Romulans and uh, Klingons and humans in our post-humanity uh, that we need to deal with. Okay, I want to end this hangout because we're almost out of time with um, this. Uh, you had mentioned that you do a lot of thinking about the policies uh, and some of the, um, uh, I guess, some of the lo- legal aspects of space travel. Now, you know, as you already know, we there is a space treaty, which most spacefaring countries have signed on to they've agreed to certain things like for example if elon musk goes to mars and messes it up that's on the united states because he's a you know it's on it, you know we're we're responsible for that um and each country has agreed to do certain things don't use military don't use it for military purposes and all, all kinds of things like that are you thinking outside of this treaty for where what kind of policies we should set for for space travel or are you using uh, is there anything different that you're thinking about doing besides that? Well, you know, people on the left and people in science fiction and futurism for a long time have imagined that we would transcend the nation state just as we transcended the city state and created nation. Yeah, states. we're still waiting on that. But we're, but we're still waiting. <laughs> and the, the UN doesn't seem to be going there anytime soon. And, um, you know, with Trump and Putin and Modi and Duterte and so forth. I, I don't know, you know, there, there's very much enthusiasm for political unification, even the European Union's falling apart. So um, I, I think that the ideal solution for a lot of these things is uh, transnational uh, governance structure, uh, so that it's not a matter of competing nation states um, st- staking different claims, much less corporations staking claims as they meet these different uh, space bodies. Um, but if, in the absence of a, trans, a, a powerful transnational political structure, it's going to have to be the nation state. And I would prefer various kinds of uh, national treaties and international treaties to govern this than to every capitalist staking a claim to their own rocks. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, there is a, also a treaty for uh, cooperative action signed about 30 years ago between U.S. and um, Soviet Union against uh, extraterrestrial aggression. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So that is such a treat as well. Oh, that's <laughs> so. nice. Well, I can tell you what, what I'm thinking about here is you've got the United States, you've got India, China, and many uh, uh, the European uh, the European Union all doing space-related activities. I don't see them sharing their technologies much with those that don't have them. So, I mean, yes, we have collaborations between, say, NASA and ESA, but it, 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 I, don't, I, I just wonder about this trickle-down. Is everybody going to benefit from this technology if the United States or even the European Union develops something that lets space travel be easier and possible for human beings? Is that going to get sent down to India? I don't know. So, well, I guess the, the more proximate concern for me is the militarization of space. Yeah, me too. Yes. Yeah. And that I, it, it's so hard to, it's just going to be such a strong impulse, isn't it? To just start putting <laughs> weapons up there and pointing them around. Don't, don't come near this thing I've just done. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same. Not, not just weapons, just redirecting an asteroid onto your enemy on Earth could be a very cost effective way to. Well, I don't know exactly. Don't give them an idea. Okay? Yeah, exactly. I know. And, and I don't know <laughs> exactly the what the. Idea. <laughs> what the wording of the treaty is, but I'll bet it it doesn't, you know, it's very specific, I'm sure, about weapons and stuff like that. But you're right, you know, the kind of action that could harm another country that isn't, that doesn't even involve weapons uh, could be yeah. an issue. And that is a good topic for another hangout. But um, I am out of time, guys. We are a little bit over. I really want to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Hughes. This, my, my guest was Dr. Dr. James Hughes, J. Uh, he's the executive director of the Institute for the Ethics of uh, and uh, Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. Thank you for a great conversation. You were thank awesome. You, Jay. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. I want to thank you all very much for uh, being here. Um, and may, I don't know. You think you might come back? We got we got a few. We didn't quite get to a lot of other things I want to talk about too. Maybe I'd in the be future. Delighted. No, right. I'm, I'm very much enthusiastic about your project, and um, you know. You're doing the universe's work. So. <laughs> Thank great. you. Oh, that yeah. makes me feel good. Yeah, that, we have lots of topics uh, which we missed out yet. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I want to thank you all. Tomorrow is, I want to remind everybody, tomorrow, 3 o'clock Eastern time is our Footsteps to Mars Hangout. We are going to be talking with people from NASA about getting there is half the fun. And we're going to talk about what technologies are going to actually get us from Earth to Mars uh, and what they're working on, some of the best technologies. So join us tomorrow, 3 o'clock uh, for that. And... Uh, Kevin, Svetlana, thank you both for for joining us. On behalf of my guests, thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.